Okay, we are in um, Matthew 28 this morning. Matthew 28. And pretty much that's where we're going to be at, I guess. It's Matthew 28, maybe Mark chapter 16. But uh, we're continuing our study of uh, the resurrection. We're kind of winding down. Uh, a few more weeks, I think, and we'll probably be uh, through with this uh, particular study. But I think it's one that we need to really look at and consider um, because the Christian faith does rest upon the truth of the resurrection. Uh, we call the Christian faith the historic Christian faith. And when we say the historic Christian faith, what that means is we believe that the Bible is genuine history. What it tells us about history is true. That Jesus Christ came, he was born of a virgin, he uh, died on the cross, he rose again on the third day. Uh, and so uh, we believe that because the Bible says so. And we have a conviction of that in our hearts because the Holy Spirit bears witness to it. And history uh, attests to it as far as we're concerned. So it's the historic Christian faith. Uh, we're in Matthew 20. Let's pray. Follow him. We do thank you for this day and for your blessings and the opportunity we have to be here this morning. We ask God that you would uh, Lord, strengthen us in our faith and Lord, help us, God, to realize the importance of this particular doctrine and Lord, help us to understand it and to acknowledge the truth that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, you can't be saved without believing that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Uh, Romans 10, 9 is very clear about that, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, that's the resurrection, thou shalt be saved. And so you might not understand it, you might not know all there is to know about it, but if in your heart you will accept that as a biblical truth, that Jesus rose from the dead, then you can be saved. But if you deny that at all, then, then you cannot be saved. So somebody that denies the resurrection, somebody that denies the virgin birth, uh, is an unsaved person, no matter how many theology degrees he has after his name. But uh, we're going to look at another thing here. We talked about the stone being rolled away. We talked about uh, uh, the body was not there. And, um, and you have to realize this too, because sometimes we don't, I think sometimes people read this and they don't think of this. But look at um, Matthew 27 here. And look at verse 50. Uh, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And um, Luke, he says, uh, uh, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, speaking to the Father. And in John, he records that the last words were, It is finished. It is finished. And when he dies, uh, salvation and redemption has been uh, completed. The resurrection has to happen too, but... Uh, everything that's been done up to this point uh, has accomplished our redemption. Um, and then look down here at um, um, verse 57 again. When the even was come, so the same evening that he died, uh, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he comes in there and he says he begs the body of Jesus. And it says there that Pilate, commands him to have to, to have the body delivered to him. So many of these people that were crucified, uh, if they had no family members uh, that would come and claim them, uh, then from what I understand, they would have been just simply left to hang there for a while, let the birds of the air peck away at them. Uh, and then they would take the bodies down, and instead of giving them any kind of proper burial, they would take them to the Valley of Gehenna which uh, was a smoldering dump, actually, uh, where they just threw all the refuse in there. And a lot of the uh, uh, leftovers from the sacrificial animals, I believe, were thrown in there as well. And so they would take some of these bodies of these crucified men and just throw them in there and just let them just, the elements do what it does and let them just rot away in the sun or whatever it might be. So it was a, a terrible way to die and uh, there was no real burial for most people. But here, Jesus Christ doesn't wind up like that. Even though the, the infidels, the skeptics, and everybody would probably say, well, there's no proof that he wasn't, therefore, you know, he was probably thrown in the, the, the Valley of Gehenna. Uh, they're good for saying that, you know, without proof you can't prove anything, and yet they have no proof of that, yet they'll make statements like that. So it's very inconsistent of them to do that. So. They hate Jesus Christ and the Bible and the gospel so much they'll make up anything. They'll be as inconsistent as they can 
uh, and then deny that they're inconsistent. But anyway, we know that he was buried in Joseph's tomb. Now, look here at uh, verse 62. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came. Again, they sealed the tomb here, right? Uh, and they set a watch, verse 66, at the tomb. They post a guard. Now, look at chapter 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, um, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. So that's the verse I was looking for last week, uh, where it said that the uh, guards uh, were so frightened that they uh, became as dead men. That's what happened here. So they basically faint away for some period of time here. Uh, and the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Um, and that's speaking in a past tense. So when the women show up, um, an angel of the Lord rolls back the stone and says he's not here. So that means he wasn't there when the angel rolled the stone back. He was already gone. So the stone wasn't rolled away to allow Jesus Christ to leave the tomb. Uh, many times we see pictures and portrayals, and even in uh, Passion plays, you'll see uh, here's, here's the tomb, and on the third day, on Sunday morning, you know, you see the, 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 the stone starts to roll away because the angel rolls it away. Then the bright light comes out, and then Jesus steps out. But that's not what happened. Right here, he didn't, do, he didn't step out of the tomb here. He was already gone. So he was gone before the stone was ever rolled away. Now, um, the way that works is like this. And that is that, um, and I'll just kind of draw it here a little bit, but you, you, you'll get the picture. And that is that um, Christ is crucified, we believe, probably on Wednesday afternoon probably around 3 o'clock p.m. and then he's buried Wednesday night at 6 p.m. probably goes in the tomb Wednesday night at 6 p.m. and so if he's in the ground in the tomb for three days and three nights then 6 p.m. Wednesday to 6 p.m. Thursday that would be uh, day two or day one that's one whole day there one whole day right and if we go to Friday and 6 p.m., we come up with day two, right? See that? I guess you can't see that over there. But anyway, and then you get to Saturday, you get to 6 p.m., 72 hours have passed, and so you come up with that's the third day. So the first day is Wednesday to Thursday, the second day is Thursday to Friday, and the third day is Friday to Saturday. So when does the Sabbath begin for a Jew? When, when, does the, when does the day begin for the Jew? It's not in the morning, it's in the evening, right? Evening and morning were the first day, Genesis 1. And the Jews, that's how they observe it. So that, that, that kind of mix, gets us mixed up sometimes. So what happens is this. Now on Sunday morning, Sunday morning, as the sun begins to come up, we'll say it's around 6 a.m., they come... The angel rolls the stone away, and they say, Jesus isn't here. Why is it? He's risen. When did he rise? He didn't rise when the stone was rolled away. He was already gone. They were just opening the tomb up to let the lady see that he's not here. Um, now, when that happens, what took place is this. Jesus Christ, after three days and three nights, a uh, 72-hour period, if he was buried at 6 p.m., at 6 p.m. on Saturday, he could rise again. That would fulfill the three days and three nights. So if that's the case, then Jesus Christ could have risen at 6 a.m. on Saturday night, and he was gone all night, and nobody knew it. Because what can he do? He can walk through walls, right? So he can walk through a tomb. He can walk through a stone wall, a stone wall there. And that's what happened. So he's already gone. And when they show up, the tomb is empty. So it was empty before they ever opened it up. 
If that's the case, then nobody rolled the stone away to steal the body because uh, uh, he was already gone. And again, that's another one of those things that like Christmas when they have the, the wise men showing up in the manger. That didn't happen. They showed up at the house probably two years later. But, you know, when they do plays and passion plays and movies, they have to, you know, use artistic license and put things together and cram things and whatever, you know, so that they can make a two-hour movie or whatever, right? But in the Bible, that's what took place there. Um, and so we got to keep that in mind when we look at that. I think it helps to have the right perspective there. So anyway, as we're looking at this thing here, uh, the Roman guard um, fell away, and um, then they uh, some of them left. But in Matthew 26, 28, um, 8 says, oh, no, 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 I just looked at the verse. Where did it go? Oh, verse 4, verse 4. For fear of him, that angel, the keepers, that's the watch, did shake and became as dead men. All right? Um, now, look at verse number 11, Matthew 28. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city. So now it says, when they were going, well, I'm assuming that's the guards, that's the watch. They're going. They're leaving the scene. Uh, so I guess that's where we get the idea that they fled. They were scared to death, they fainted, and then when they woke up, I guess they got up and left. Verse 11, now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city. So not all of them went into the city. Some of them just scattered out in the countryside or whatever. But some of them go into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. So they go to the chief priest and say, hey, we got, we got a report. Here's the latest report. Um, and when it says they showed them to the chief priest, it doesn't mean that they showed them in the sense that they visibly showed them pictures and stuff like that, but that word show can also mean tell something. Um, that word is used that way in your King James Bible in two ways. It's, it's used in a sense of telling somebody something or actually showing somebody something and demonstrating it. In this case, here the context is uh, that they're just telling them what took place. Um, and so they tell them what happened, verse 12. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So... This would have been during the time of the, by the way, the book of Acts, uh, when people were mocking the resurrection of Christ. And the Jewish Sanhedrin was arresting the, the apostles, uh, beating them, imprisoning them, threatening them, etc., that they shouldn't be preaching this doctrine in Jerusalem, that Jesus Christ was crucified by them, they're responsible for it, and that he also rose from the dead. So they didn't want them preaching the gospel. They didn't want them preaching the death of Christ, or the resurrection of Christ. So they were against the gospel. Um, and this, he says this report is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now when you think about that, think about, think about when you're in your Bible. Uh, the Bible's written in such a way that lots of times you read the Bible, it feels like you're right there in the moment. That's the way it's written. It's written as if you're there in the moment observing this and experiencing this with the writer. But then every now and then he'll put something like this in here where he says... Um, this saying that, that he just recorded is reported commonly among the Jews until this day. Well, the day that Matthew wrote the book of the, the Gospel of Matthew was not 33 AD when Christ was crucified. Um, it was written sometime later. I forget the exact date it was written. I'm sure a good reference Bible, even my scope, it probably tells you the date. But uh, this may have been written uh, 30 years afterwards. And if he said, if that's the case, then 30 years after the death and resurrection of Christ, he said the Jews are still commonly reporting fake news. <laughs> right? It's fake news. They're saying he didn't rise again from the dead, and yet the apostles, the eyewitnesses, are saying he did. Okay? So, um, anyway. So, the guard goes AWOL. Uh, the Roman guard fled. Uh, they left their place of responsibility. This, is to, this has to be explained away. Because the military discipline of the Romans was exceptionally good. Justin, in his Digest number 49, mentions all offenses which required the 
penalty of death. And then uh, he names those things. I think I may have read some of those last week. Uh, but one of them was uh, leaving a night watch um, and uh, falling asleep um, on duty. Uh, and they fell out that night. Uh, and matter of fact, it says here in Matthew 28 here, he says um, in verse number 13, they are to say, his disciples came by night and stole them away while we slept. So if they admit they were sleeping, that deserves the death penalty according to Roman law at that time. But they weren't executed. There's no record of them being executed. They should have been. And why weren't they? Because it was all a setup. Uh, if they wanted again to prove that Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, all they had to do was just go look in the tomb and his body should have been laying there. But and it was only a 20 minute walk probably from downtown Jerusalem to where they crucified him and buried him. So it was easy to go disprove the resurrected Christ. But apparently nobody, if they did that, they didn't tell. They may have gone there and locked, looked and seen for themselves. No doubt they did go. It doesn't record that, but we would just assume that they held an inquiry and they said, okay, well, you got to go check this out. No doubt they went and looked and didn't find a body. And so they've got to come up with some excuse. And so they bribed the guards to lie about it. Uh, politicians... Uh, and religious people, or all, bribe people, intimidate people all the time to tell falsehoods and lies. Um, let's see, uh, here's the fear of punishment. Um, one way a guard was put to death was by being stripped of his clothes, then burned alive in a fire started with his own garments. So, you think you're going to lie about Jesus Christ? rising from the dead just on your own that says they bribed them to do that um, the entire unit certainly would not have fallen asleep with that threat hanging over their heads the history of Roman discipline and security testifies to the fact that if the tomb had not been empty uh, the soldiers would never have left their position nor would they have gone to the high priest if it was not empty the fear of the wrath of their superiors and the possibility of the death penalty meant they paid close attention to the most minute details of their job. Uh, Dr. George Curie, who studied carefully the military discipline of the Romans, wrote that fear of punishment uh, produced flawless attention to duty, especially in the night watches. So they, were, they made sure they didn't fall asleep. Uh, that seems harsh, but um, I mean, even our own military, uh, I don't know if it's that way now or not, but it used to be World War I, World War II, probably Korea. Uh, that if, you know, you fell asleep on duty at night, you'd be executed. You could be shot for that. Now, that doesn't mean they would shoot you every time, but you could have been shot for that. Um, and the best thing to do is if you're, you fell asleep and the next guy's coming in to relieve you of your watch at 2 o'clock in the morning and you fell asleep, that hopefully he's a buddy that says, hey, man, wake up. And send him home and don't say nothing. Don't report him. Um... But uh, no doubt that happened quite a few times, I'm sure. Um, let's see. Doc, here's again. I think I read this last week. I'll read it again. Dr. Bill White, uh, at the time of this writing, was in charge of the garden tomb in Jerusalem. Uh, his responsibilities have uh, caused him to study quite extensively the resurrection and the events following the first Easter. And here's what his observations are. He records them. And let me say this. If you've gone to any... Uh, if you go into the national parks, I guess even state parks, but national parks particularly, and you, you go to these parks, well, I guess state parks too. But anyway, if you go to some places like, for instance, you go to Shiloh, go to Gettysburg, uh, go up to uh, Andrew Jackson's uh, uh, house up there in um, Nashville, something. It's the Hermitage. Is it the Hermitage or? Is he the Hermitage? What's Thomas Jefferson? Uh, Jefferson was Monticello, right? I think. How many know that? Okay, so the Hermitage is Andrew Jackson, right? So if you go up there and you visit these places, they've got people that dress in period costumes. They walk around and act as if they're living back in the day, right? And so, uh, and they'll tell you stuff. And uh, they'll start explaining what this is or what that is or what this was or how that worked or who these people were and stuff. And they'll just be going through all this stuff. And no doubt a lot of those people probably are 
hist history majors, I guess. Um, and some of them are actually uh, professors at some of the local colleges. And uh, so uh, they'll go through and they will explain all this stuff to you because they, they've studied what it is that they are, uh, that their job is to explain, right? And so you learn a lot of good details. And if you've read any books, you can ask some intelligent questions of those people. And, uh, and I've asked some questions of them that I've read about just to see if they really know what they're talking about. And I'm, I'm surprised that every time I've asked them a question, they said, that's a very good question. Yes, this is what happened. This is what they did. Yes, you're right. That's what blah, 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 blah. And uh, so they know what they're talking about. They've studied the history of the places and the people and the time frame and all that. So here this guy is the, in charge of the garden tomb in Jerusalem. Uh, where they believe that Jesus Christ was buried. And so he studied it. And this is his observations. If the stone were simply rolled to one side of the tomb, as would be necessary to enter it, then they might be justified in accusing the men of sleeping at their post and punishing them severely. If the men protested that the earthquake broke the seal and that the stone rolled back under the vibration, they would still be liable to punishment for behavior which might be labeled cowardice. In other words, if the, the earthquake occurred, the seal was broken, the stone rolled back because of the vibration of the, of the earthquake, and they ran away, then they would be accused of cowardice, which is another um, uh, punishment that's liable to the death penalty for, 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 for uh, leaving their post. And they wouldn't have left um, if the body was still there, but the angel showed up and the body wasn't there. Um, but these responsibilities don't meet the case. There was some undeniable evidence which made it impossible for the chief priests to bring any charge against the guard. The Jewish authorities must have visited the scene, examined the stone, and recognized its position as making it humanly impossible for their men to have permitted its removal. No twist of human ingenuity could provide an adequate answer or scapegoat, and so they were forced to bribe the guard and seek to hush things up. So it's a cover-up. So the, 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 the thing happens. The guards are frightened. They leave their post. They scatter. Some go to the priest and say, hey, this is what we just saw. This is what just happened here. And so it doesn't report in the Bible, but we would assume that they did go back and look at it themselves and check it out. And then when they saw, they said, okay, we've got to find some way to cover up this because it sure does look like his body isn't here. Um, and if the guards were up all night, they didn't see anything unusual happen. We know they didn't go to sleep on guard duty. They were awake all night. They were bribed to lie and say they did, but that would lead us to assume that they didn't actually fall asleep. They all stayed awake. They didn't hear anything. They didn't see anything. Until the next morning when the earthquake occurs and the angel of the Lord rolls that stone away, and at that point, uh, now they're frightened, and do they look in the tomb to see if there was anything in there, or they just run? In any case, they did flee, and some of them did tell the Sanhedrin, no doubt they sent out, they went out themselves to see for themselves, and so now we got a problem on our hands here. They're going to say that his body was stolen. But then again, you got to talk about the tomb. How did they open the tomb? with the guard on duty. How did they roll that stone away without waking somebody up if they were asleep? Um, and then go in there and steal the body and take it out. Uh, again, it was like a, at least one ton stone and you're not, you're not going to move that. So anyway, it's a cover-up. Um, and then the grave clothes. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John 20, John chapter 20, and um, look here at um, verse number 1. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth, and cometh Simon Peter, the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. 
Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down, looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and see the linen clothes lie. Uh, at this point here, we're assuming that the guards have fled. Uh, they've already gone. There's nobody there. So when Peter and John come uh, to see what Mary and Martha are telling them about, that the stone is rolled away, and this and that, whatever, um, then uh, what happens here is they come in there, and there's nobody there. There's no guards there either. Um, look at this here, verse 6. And then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie. So the linen clothes that they wrapped him in were lying there on that slab. And the napkin, which was that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Um, so this is the note I have on that. In a literal sense, the tomb, um, let's see... Uh, This is what he writes here. In a literal sense, the tomb was not actually empty. Instead, an amazing phenomenon occurred. After visiting the grave and seeing the stone rolled away, the women ran back and told the disciples. Then Peter and John took off running. John outran Peter. And upon arriving at the tomb, he didn't enter. Instead, he leaned over and looked in and saw something so startling that he immediately believed. He looked over to the place where the body of Jesus had lain. There were grave clothes in the form of a body slightly caved in and empty, like the empty uh, shell of a caterpillar's cocoon. That was enough to make a believer out of anybody. He never did get over it. The first thing that stuck in the minds of the disciples was not the empty tomb, but the empty grave clothes, undisturbed in their form and position. Okay. So what he's saying is this. He said when he goes in there, there's the grave clothes on the slab where they'd laid the body. Well, the body was in there, so that would have been filled. But when they walked in, the grave clothes were no doubt kind of caved in because there was no body in there anymore. Uh, and look at what it says again. Peter comes in and he sees the linen clothes lying there and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself as if it was wrapped and left there. Indicating that somebody it was there, somebody left, and somebody... Made up their bed before they left, or at least the pillow. So there's the there. So you would have a body laying on that slab, and then when they walked in, they saw the linen clothes just simply just lying on the flat, I guess, rumpled, crumpled up there on the on the slab. But then the headpiece was wrapped up neatly, apparently, and left by itself. Um, so. If they had stolen the body of Christ, I would assume they would have taken him with the grave clothes. They wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap this, that, whatever. Um, and so uh, they just simply, uh, that, that, that's another indication that uh, the body was not stolen. It just wasn't there. He had gotten up during the night and already left. Okay? Uh, and then there's appearances of Christ also. Oh, and they say this also, uh, just a note that I wrote down here. Uh, the Shroud of Turin uh, that you've heard of, the Catholic Church has over there in Italy, it's been examined, and some people say it's actually the uh, shroud that Jesus Christ was buried in, and others say it's not. I'm of the opinion that it's not. Um, they looked at the blood, I guess, that's on the blood stains and things like that. And Personally, I believe the blood of Christ is not on the earth. I believe it, it's up in heaven on the mercy seat, most likely. Um, it's not on the mercy seat below Calvary where it dripped. <laughs> I don't believe it's there, or some people said that. But anyway, um, the note says this. Uh, this would discount the Shroud of Turin. Why? Because uh, a uh, neatly folded napkin, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this napkin lying by itself, which was wrapped around the head, no doubt, um, was uh, shown that there was at least two pieces to this thing. Um, so I guess they would say that he was wrapped in this shroud of Turin before he was wrapped with these other things. I guess that's what they would say. 
But uh, anyway, that's debatable. Uh, and uh, uh, preachers say this when they preach on this. They'll say that a neatly folded napkin means you're coming back. You ever heard that? Okay, let's see here. Um, here I am at dinner. Got my napkin here. And uh, I've used it. And uh, stuff like that. When I'm done at the restaurant, I do that. Waitress comes by and sees that crumpled napkin. He said, she said, oh, they must be done. Starts cleaning the table off. But now if I wrap it up real nice after I've even used it and lay it up here, that indicates that I'm not done yet. Maybe I just went off to the men's room or something. And whatever, the lady went off to freshen up in the ladies' room, but I'm coming back. That's what it indicates. Um, now, if you're not very refined, that probably doesn't make sense to you. But if you're refined, some restaurants, I'm sure they would recognize that. It's okay, you know, he's not done or he is done. Well, he, he wrapped it up together and put it back out there, which that means he's coming back, indicating the second coming. Um, somebody said, well, that's kind of a stretch. Well, I think I said before, good preaching doesn't always make good doctrine, and good doctrine always doesn't make the best preaching. So that's kind of, that's kind of in between there. That's good preaching and good doctrine, I think. So anyway, so next thing we'll look at when we look at this again, we'll talk about the... Um, uh, witnesses, the witnesses to the resurrection, and who they are, what they said, things of that nature. And uh, again, a couple more weeks, I think we'll be done with this. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, have we do thank you once again for this day and for your blessings, and ask God that you bless the Lord of God we study this morning. Pray God that uh, Father, you would bless the services to come. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.